All right, we are one minute past the top of the hour. I see we have more attendees trickling in, but I'll get started with introductions so we can leave plenty of time for our speakers. Um, my name is Samantha Weintraub Left. Thank you very much for attending this month's science seminar presented by the National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. We are very excited to have Roland Kays and Arielle Parsons with us to speak at this month's science seminar. But before we turn it over to the speakers, uh, a few logistics. So first we have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you would like to use this feature, please find the CC button in your own personal Zoom menu. The webinar will consist of a presentation. The speakers will both be presenting. Um, followed by a Q&A. Now, as you think of questions throughout the talk, feel free to pose them in the Q&A box and we'll facilitate a discussion at the end. There should also be opportunity to ask questions over audio. So when we get to the Q&A period, feel free to raise your hand and we should have time to unmute and take a few questions. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. And this is outlined in the NEON Code of Conduct, which you can find linked on the bottom of our Science Seminars webpage, which I have also put in the chat and I will share again. So please check out our Code of Conduct. Um, it does apply to all of the NEON staff, as well as anyone external to the NEON program who's participating in an event. And of course, we don't expect this from our beautiful community, but anyone who would violate our principles would, of course, this would be grounds for removal from the meeting. Um, this talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing um, on the NEON Science Seminars webpage, which I'm showing here. So all of the talks when there is a recording, you can just click on that and that will take you to the recorded talk on our YouTube page. Um, to complement these monthly science seminars that we're giving, we are also hosting related data skills webinars that teach people how to access and use NEON data. Uh, you can register for those on the same science seminars webpage. You just keep scrolling down. You can learn more about the data skills webinar. And the one coming up at the end of January is extremely relevant. Our own Sarah Paul, who you'll hear from in a moment, is going to go through a tutorial of introducing the NEON small mammal data. So we hope you can join us for that if you're interested. And lastly, we are soliciting nominations for the 2023-24 round of speakers for this very seminar series. So please consider nominating yourself or a colleague today by filling out this form, uh, which is linked here near the top of the seminar series uh, webpage. Okay, that's it for me. Now I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Paul to introduce today's speakers. All right, thanks, Samantha. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be introducing Dr. Ariel Parsons and Dr. Roland Kays, and they're gonna be giving a joint presentation on neon mammals, large and small. So Dr. Ariel Parsons is a research scientist in the Alexander Center at the Lincoln Park Zoo. She's a quantitative ecologist and population biologist, and her work focuses on wildlife population dynamics, movement, and interspecific interactions. And she's worked extensively with large-scale ecological data sets and citizen science observations on a range of questions like global change impacts on mammal abundance and modeling factors that affect disease risk in, in humans. And then Dr. Kays is a professor at North Carolina State University and director of the Biodiversity Lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And his work focuses on ecology and conservation of mammals using camera traps and animal tracking to study animal movement. And he's also the co-founder of camera trapping database Wildlife Insights and the animal tracking database MoveBank. So with that, I'm very excited to turn it over to the speakers and uh, I think Ariel is gonna start. Great, thank you so much, Sarah and Samantha for inviting us here. Roland and I are really excited um, about presenting our work. Let me get this started here. All right. So yeah, so we're, we're gonna be talking about some of our work, um, looking at uh, analyzing the NEON data and also adding some of our uh, supplementary camera trapping data um, to look at trends in, in populations of mammals, both uh, large and small.
So we're living, uh, as everyone is, is no doubt aware in this age of, of relatively rapid change um, across the planet from uh, rapidly increasing human populations, which uh, comes with it, with it rapid, rapid um, habitat destruction, deforestation, and then of course, climate change. And all of these changes, of course, um, exert pressures on um, ecosystems, on communities, on what, and on populations um, of plants and animals. And you know, so to to really kind of understand these pressures um, and how um, these pressures might be influencing um, population change over space and time, we need to collect a huge amounts of data across these really large spatial scales, um, but also these really long temporal scales. So these kind of yearly or monthly data and um, have the ability to really uh, analyze them on a variety of species um, and locations and scales to understand how these changes are influencing uh, populations, communities and ecosystems. And ultimately, if, if there's some way that we can, we can mitigate, of course, these changes. Now, just because you know these changes are, are often thought detrimental to some species or, or communities or ecosystems, there are of course some success stories. The uh, classic would be that of the, the common raccoon. But for every success story, especially when we're thinking about animal species and we're thinking about mammals, uh, there are of course these these stories of um, you know extinctions in the wild and an increased extinction risk. Uh, and so you know there's a real um, need to understand, of course, uh, how this is this is impacting uh, animal populations, wildlife populations, and we're seeing these trends, of course, of reductions in global biodiversity and the implications, of course, for those um, reductions on uh, things like ecosystem services. And so uh, a lot, getting these, these large scale data sets, large both spatial and temporal scale data sets, um, allow us to really understand and monitor these changes, identify them as they're happening, of course, but ultimately understand what is driving them and what can we do to maybe halt or, um, you know, or eliminate them. Uh, that's, of course, the, the dream. Now, NEON is going a long way, of course, to enabling us to do that here in the United States. So we've got, you know, this coverage of the continental U.S. We've got Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico included. Um, and you know, over these 81 field sites, we're we're sampling in each of these 20 ecoclimatic domains, and so we're we're getting, of course, that spatial coverage, um, and we're getting you know coverage that will enable us to address um, questions about a lot of these these large scale changes that are taking place across the country and across the planet. Um, and then continuing that through time, we've already gotten in some cases nine years of data and counting, which is super exciting. And then continuing that through time is going to enable us to get that temporal kind of long temporal scale to be able to really understand these changes and these dynamics that that although I'm calling them rapid, you know, in reality, it takes years and decades to perceive those changes um, and really understand them. So really exciting, of course, data set. I don't need to, to sell you guys on it. Um, but, you know, just kind of to give that context, we, of course, have all of these data, um, these biological data, which include um, the mammal data, the small mammal data that we'll be talking about today, but, of course, across a number of different taxa, um, plants, animals, you know, arthropods, microbes, um, kind of runs, you know, up and down in terms of um, food web dynamics and entire communities, communities and ecosystems. And then we've got all sorts of abiotic data collection on different scales, other kind of habitat variables. And, and that really, again, gives us the ability to, um, to be able to, to really model in terms of changes um, in some of these, uh, especially animal communities, changes in, in these um, abundances over time and um, trying to identify what factors, whether they be biotic factors or abiotic factors, may be associated with these changes or even be driving them. So Roland and I are, are mammalogists, I would say. So we will be focusing on mammal populations today. And when we think about changes in mammal populations over space and time, you know, that uh, over, or I should say over space, you know, this really happens kind of over uh, these short time scales or over these more, you know, long-term time scales where we start to see and perceive some of these um, differences and be able to make predictions in terms of, of climate change, for example. 
And you know, in both cases, we can get these comparisons um, over time and space. We can um, start to make inference on drivers of population change over time and space. Um, but it's really these long-term trends um, that require you know, long, very long-term data sets where we can start to see um, you know, trends in populations over time. Um, and we can start to, to really understand that the variation in terms of drivers of that change and be able to make the most robust predictions um, for, for example, you know, how we might expect species to, to um, uh, adapt or respond to climate change. For the purposes of the talk here and the results that we'll be presenting to you, we're going to be focusing on these uh, short-term changes uh, in, in abundance. So at each of these uh, NEON sites, or I should say at a, at a subset of NEON sites, um, there is a small mammal trapping. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about the small and the large mammals. I will be starting with the small mammals and focusing on that NEON box trapping data set. Um, and then Roland's going to follow up talking about some supplementary data analysis that we did at NEON sites where we put out camera traps to survey large mammals. And so he'll talk about uh, some of those findings um, and, and relate them to the small mammal findings. So the small mammal box trapping data set, um, you're, most of you are probably uh, aware of it, but um, you know, these are uh, small mammals that are under uh, 500 grams. They're nocturnal. Uh, they forage above uh, the ground. They're non-volant. So those are the species that we're talking about um, when we talk about this data set. They're captured in um, Sherman live traps across um, 46 sites um, that have at least at one time had small mammal sampling. And this covers most of the ecoclimatic domains of NEON. Um, at each of these sites, there's anywhere from about three to eight mammal, uh, small mammal trapping grids of 100 uh, Sherman traps that are set. Um, and this happens several times a year. And then each sampling will be done for just a single night or for three consecutive nights, all within the same approximate time in the lunar cycle. And so from this effort, we get um, three kind of main data sets. We get a, a large mark recapture data set with individual IDs for each of the um, individuals that are captured. We get some DNA sequencing data so that we can correct the identifications for especially for those species that are difficult to identify in the field. And then we get some disease um, information, which I'm not going to be uh, using and, and talking about, but it's a, another kind of cool data set um, that's related to this small mammal box trapping data set. So when we get all these data and we get kind of these counts of species uh, from the traps, we can develop maps based solely on these counts, um, which we call an abundance index. Um, here's an example with Paramiscus maniculatus. And this can kind of give us an idea of where this species might be relatively more abundant versus less abundant. We see this species relatively more abundant in the north and the west. Um, less abundant or, in fact, you know, ac actually absent um, from a lot of these um, southeastern areas. So it, it can give us kind of that range map sort of idea. The problem with this index, which is just solely based on the counts, is that it doesn't always represent true abundance, or at least if we're trying to follow these trends over these, these large spatial scales and over time, we might not be getting an accurate picture of, of the overall trends and the overall changes. So I'll, I'll belabor this point geekily for, for just a minute. Um, so these rock counts that we use for abundance indices are actually the product of, of two different quantities. So these are the counts of individuals that we capture in traps during a trapping session at a trapping array. So one of those grid of 100 traps. The products uh, is, the, uh, is a product of the true abundance of the population of a given species on that grid and the probability of detecting individuals when we go out and capture. So that if P, the detection probability is one, then we would be capturing all of the individuals in a population every time we went out and tracked. But those of us who have done field biology know that that's almost never the case. And usually P is less than one, which means that we're just getting a subset of the population. Now, that might be okay for the purposes of tracking trends in abundance over time and trying to determine what might be driving those changes, but it also might not be okay, and I'll give you kind of some cartoon examples. So here is this index of abundance C, and it's kind of trend over time or space. 
okay? It's got some trend. Now, if detection probability is constant, then we then in fact that that index C really reflects the trend in true abundance over time or space and could be a reliable proxy. And whatever inference we make on changes in that index over time and space would be valid um, because they would be replicating basically what we see in, um, in abundance. But, but what tends to happen uh, sometimes uh, or perhaps more often than we would like to think is that we see this trend in our counts and we also have a trend in our detection probability over time and space, such that it could be that the trend that we're seeing in that index is actually a, a trend in detection probability and not a trend in abundance. Uh, maybe abundance is constant. This is just an example, but it is a way to illustrate the importance of accounting and estimating detection probability so that we can get an accurate representation of the actual changes in abundance over time and space and what's actually happening in a population. To drive this home, this is some of our results from the NEON data where we estimated detection probability for several species across different sites, so different trapping grids um, across the NEON system. And we see that over those sites, so these box plots are quite tall for some of these species, for most of these species, which indicates that we have quite a lot of variation in detection probability across sites. And so if we simply use the count as an index, we, we might be missing of the true trend and the true differences in um, abundance over those sites. So this was all a rather long-winded way of saying the capture-recapture data that we get from NEON is really valuable. Um, and in particular, the capture-recapture data for those um, trapping plots where we have at least three nights of successive sampling. It is with those multiple nights of successive sampling, usually three or more, where we can get our most accurate estimates of detection probability that we use then to correct our counts and get estimates of abundance. And we can also use those multiple nights of sampling to assess factors that might affect de detection probability. And that can be interesting in and of itself. So using the capture recapture data from NEON, um, we were able to generate um, over 9,000 total abundance estimates for um, 47 species spanning 2014 to 2019 at over 300 of those trapping grids, which represented 44 geographic sites. So a whole lot of data, 9,000 total abundance estimates. It, it's a lot of abundance estimates. So it's really cool that we have that 47 species is really amazing. And we did use the genetic data available to correct any ID. So we had the most accurate data and, and the most data for some of these species um, that was possible. And so with these estimates, we're able to see trends in abundance over time and space. So here's um, a look at trends in abundance over time. This is one trapping site. So this is Abbey 002. This is one um, trapping array, one grid. And the five species um, that were most commonly detected, so those five species for which we can get abundance estimates. And we see you know, quite a bit of fluctuation for some of them over time. Here's another example at ORNL 039, where three species, we were able to get abundance estimates for three species there. And we see you know, still some, some fluctuation, maybe not quite as drastic. These um, abundances are, are uh, quite a bit lower. So we see you know, kind of that difference across these sites and over time. And what's interesting is if we then kind of associate that and overlay that with um, some of the environmental data that we get for those same sites in those same time periods, we start to see some species that really um, track and are really well correlated with patterns in temperature or precipitation. Um, so, for example, uh, the one that, that I think is really stark is that ORNL 039 Tamia striatus seems to really track that um, temperature uh, quite a bit. So, so there's, you know, some clear associations that we can make between um, some of these trends in abundance over time and environmental factors, which can kind of lead us um, in terms of, of trying to, to tease apart what may, might be driving uh, some of these changes. Of course, we can also plot um, these changes in abundance over space. Um, you know, traditionally we would do that with, with a map, um, you know, kind of like this, where we can see where, where are we detecting uh, a given species? This is Paramiscus maniculatus. You know, where are they uh, found at their highest abundances versus their lowest abundances? Um, 
And um, you know, so that's really useful in terms of range and understanding how ranges might shift and change and understanding how different environmental factors at these sites uh, might be supporting or you know, inhibiting potentially um, these high abundances. One other way that I like to look at that and, and that we've um, been looking at it um, uh, with the NEON data is with what we are calling niche plots. Um, and so this is kind of a way to, to look at um, those spatial trends, those spatial patterns in terms of environmental factors. So here we're looking at the abundance of Dipotomies ordii along the axes of temperature and precipitation. And so we're kind of, we're, we're getting the frequency of their abundances, so weighted by their abundances, such that the yellow color in that plot is showing us where we are finding them in their highest, at their highest abundances. And then the dark blue is showing us where we are finding them, but at relatively low abundance, kind of, you know, kind of the edges of, of their range and their, and their tolerance or their preference, if you will. And so what we're seeing in the yellow is that you know, this species is, is a, a high temperature species and a low precipitation species. And of course, for your the small mammal biologists out there, this is not news. Um, this is, of course, an arid uh, species. Um, but you know, we, we kind of can get that this pictorial uh, idea of, of their range and of their habitat preferences, of their environmental tolerances, from these niche plots, and then over time, you know, we could we could track uh, any shifts, um, you know, as environmental conditions change or as uh, new species are introduced to the community. Um, there are lots of different ways that we can kind of look at at trends in in these in associations over time and space. So so far, I've talked, you know, given you some population comparison examples with the neon data, this neon small mammal data, and I separated them to those over time and those over space. But the beauty of, of course, the neon data is that we have both, and we can make these these simultaneous um, this inference on simultaneous spatial and temporal patterns, which is is really exciting. Uh, you know, again, like one of the the real strengths of uh, the data set and, and of the continued monitoring uh, of these sites. So here's kind of an example of what I mean. This is not from Neon Data, this is from eBird, but um, you know, it's, it's the same idea where in the red, we have areas where the wood thrush over time, wood thrush abundance has gone down. And in the blue are areas where wood thrush abundance has um, increased. And so trying to understand, of course, what is driving those changes is the key. Is, you know, can we determine what, what's happening there and why this range is, is essentially shifting? Um, because uh, of course, then that helps us understand how these, these um, you know, global changes are affecting wildlife populations and maybe what we can do. So to get that with the NEON data, we used um, a modeling method, which is uh, called GJAM. It's Generalized Joint Attribute Modeling. Um, and in, in this case, um, we're, I'm looking at, at, at modeling changes in abundance over time um, it, it, as a function of three components, okay? Dispersal, not a big deal for small mammals, so we can you know, more or less ignore that, but, but still uh, you know, a component here of this model. The environment, so environmental factors, of course, like climate, uh, habitat. You know, what are what are the preferences? What are the needs of, of each species within a community? And then we can we can make this. This is a community level model, so we can actually incorporate other members of the community and assess species interactions. And in the small mammal community, we're talking competition. So, how do these three components? Um, ultimately affect or uh, um, uh, contribute to changes in abundance over time for each member of the small mammal community that we sampled, or at least that we're able to estimate abundance for from the NEON data. Um, and so this is a, a dynamic version. So it allows us to look at this over time. And the input is those true abundance estimates taken from the capture recapture uh, from the NEON data set. And this all comes from uh, Jim Clark at, at Duke, if anyone's interested um, in this paper. And so when we run this model on the neon abundance estimates that we generated, we can rank what is the relative importance, what is the relative sensitivity of changes in abundance over time to those three components, the environment, 
dispersal or species interactions. And so we've got here 16 species from the um, NEON um, data set. And uh, we can see that environment in the orange ranks significantly higher than the other two components for almost every species, meaning that the environment is more important to in terms of uh, being a, a, a potential driver of changes of abundance over time. It's more important um, than dispersal or species interactions for most members of this community. And so that environment encompass, encompasses several things. Um, and we, we did include um, covariates for uh, food availability, so mast, grass seeds, so those measurements that come from the NEON data, um, understory, leaf litter, other measurements that, that are part of the NEON data set. Um, but above all, it, were, it, was, it ended up being climate that um, was the most important environmental factor. Um, in terms of, 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 of um, changes in abundance over time for these species, in particular temperature and precipitation, um, ranked uh, much more highly even, even than mast availability or, or uh, grass seed availability. Now, just because um, uh, the environment ranked higher than species interaction for almost all of the species in the community, uh, doesn't mean that we weren't able to identify some seemingly important um, interactions between species, so competitive interactions in this community. So here we are looking at um, the effect of the density of species one on the y-axis on the growth rate of species two on the x-axis. And the darker colors represent pairwise competitive interactions that were particularly strong, okay, where, where species one, in, in this case, either Paramyscus maniculatus or Paramyscus leucopus, seem to be exerting an effect in terms of their density at higher densities in suppressing the growth rate of um, these four other species down below. So this is an indication that in some cases there are some strong interactions potentially in these small mammal communities. Now, whether or not they're having a big effect um, is, is uh, unclear and, and deserves some more study, but we did um, find some, a couple interesting things. I'll just give you a couple uh, examples here as I wrap up. Um, the first, so, so these were two species, Paramyscus maniculatus and Paragnathus flavus, which we identified as having a strong interaction or a relatively strong interaction in this community. And we do see a pretty clear negative relationship in abundances where, you know, at high abundances for Paramyscus, we tend to um, get low abundances for Paragnathus. Um, you know, so that, that certainly supports some sort of competitive interaction. What was more interesting um, to me was, was this relationship kind of played out along gradients of environmental factors. So um, in this case, I'm gonna show the example of temperature. So here we are looking at the, the, that frequency weighted uh, abundance, I, I should say abundance weighted frequency for paramyscus maniculatus. So kind of, again, showing, you know, what, where, where is their temperature tolerance? Where are they found at the highest abundances? And that's at that peak of the curve there. So this is where we find paramyscus. And the purple here is that same abundance weighted frequency of paragnathus in the absence. So at sites and during times when paramyscus is absent. And so we see quite a bit of overlap with, um, you know, along that, that frequency, abundance-weighted frequency of paramyscus. So they're, they're using, you know, similar temperature kind of ranges. But here's what it looks like in the yellow when paramyscus is present. And we see that paragnathus is either not present or present at very, very low abundances um, at sites and during times when paramyscus is present. Um, and uh, at the optimum uh, of paramyscus. So this is kind of, uh, again, an, in an indication that we have this mediation of this competitive interaction potentially by some of these environmental factors. So this is you know, really interesting and something that, that we're gonna be studying more and something that was, that was made possible um, by the NEON data and the NEON data collection. So these comparisons of small mammal populations over time and space, space um, suggest some drivers, potential drivers of population change. Um, climate, habitat, and competition, with climate seemingly ranking as more important to the small mammal um, community than habitat or competition for most species. Now, whether this holds for large mammals, so we'll have to let Roland tell us. So I will hand it over to him.
All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, I'm going to jump in now and go on to talk about some of the large mammal stuff that we did with camera traps. Um, some similar questions, some different questions. Uh, unfortunately, not getting to competition, but um, uh, so camera traps are great because they record the presence and the relative abundance of larger species uh, without any bait, without any any interaction. We're just putting these cameras out on the trees and seeing how often animals walk by. And uh, our goals of this were to, you know, for one, let's just see what what animals are out there at these neon sites and what are some of the factors that drive their abundance and distribution. So some similar questions to what our Ariel talked about. Um, and then also, look, can we start to map out these mammal communities across the continent? Uh, do we start to see differences? Where are those differences? And can we use these data to actually create these maps? Um, and in particular, we also are focusing in on the importance of mast, the seeds and fruits that trees make, because this is mammal food. Uh, and this is part of what Ariel talked about. That was part of her habitat measurement. But I want to go into this a little bit more detail. Um, this comes from our, um, because here's some mammals eating mast, right? Obviously important for a lot of, of, of the squirrels, um, but also uh, a lot of the larger mammals here. You can see a gray fox with some uh, some seeds in his mouth. Um, and um, uh, this, this data comes from uh, our colleague, uh, Jim Clark down the street in uh, Duke University. Um, and this also is made in part with neon data um, and, and other data, but basically lots of these seed traps um, that he that that allow him to fit this model uh, that says for a given kind of tree of a given size and given conditions, how many seeds will they make on a typical year? So this is not year to year variation necessarily. But once he does that, he can then um, make predictions uh, for other uh, other places based on the uh, uh, a forest inventory plot. So exa for example, if you have a FIA forest uh, analysis and inventory plot where you know how many trees there are and uh, what size they are and what the conditions were like, he can predict on a typical year how many kilos of seeds will be made for each one of those. So, you know, basically he's saying, if you tell us your forest composition, I'll tell you how many seeds that we'll have uh, for a given species on a typical year. And he's working on year to year predictions in the future. So this is some of the, the data that we have in here that, that turns out to be pretty important. Um, we, so, so camera traps are not part of the standard neon protocol uh and so we had to run them ourselves uh as part of um uh, of this project so we, we visited all these sites there's a couple non-neon sites here as well uh we tried to get to all the major regions that had trees because because of this focus on this this tree mast um some of the the desert or pr predominantly grassland sites we did not visit um and so I, i'll show you around a little bit as we go in in, in more detail and our basic idea was um to get a, represent, a representative sample of the site. Uh, so we put out 50 cameras, about 300 to 500 meter spacing on a grid. Uh, we leave them out for a month or a little bit later. Generally, we would set them. And then some of our uh, Jim's group, the, the uh, plant crew that was going out and checking these seed traps, they would pick them up, send it back to us, and we'd process the data. So I'll show you a little bit. It was really fun to get a chance to see some of these different places, lots of different habitats. Uh, we teamed up with lots of different camera trappers uh, all across the country. I uh, had the joy of getting stuck, you know, cars stuck on sandy roads, um, setting, uh, when you set them on these trees that had just burnt, you'd get all covered in, in soot from setting cameras on the trees. Um, here's a, a camera in Ordway uh, Swisher that um, they burned while we were there, and, and, and the burn crew was actually nice enough to defend our tree. <laughs> they stood there. You can see the camera with the, the tree of the camera on there, not burnt. It actually saved our camera, which for which we're very grateful. Um, on up to Talladega, some great uh, a pine forest, a lot hillier than I was ever expecting. Tromping around through there, setting cameras was uh, a lot more exhausting than I was expecting. Uh, um, and uh, we had some um, in the southeast, got a number of these invasive feral, feral hogs looking quite fecund there. Also some uh, beautiful bobcats looking out for the piglets. Um, on up to the kind of mid-Atlantic, we had a number of sites here. Um, uh, great, uh, uh, cool forest and, and understory vegetation in uh, Mountain Lake Biological Station in Virginia. Nice open places, lots of places to set cameras. Um, are these bears dancing or fighting? Uh, they were fighting and and they actually, uh, we, we didn't put bear boxes on our camera, unfortunately, and we got some of our cameras chewed up at this site. Um, here's a picture from Duke Forest where there is a neighborhood nearby 
and a neighborhood cat wandered in uh, where he shouldn't have, I think. Um, on up to the Northeast, uh, to Harvard, Harvard Forest, um, and uh, up, up to a site in New Hampshire in the White Mountains as well. Um, now, this wasn't actually a real, we kind of, we, we brought a couple extra cameras just to set in really dramatic places to try to get good video, and this was uh, one of those. Um, we did get some moose up there, which is super great. Um, up to uh, the Great Lakes, we hit Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, got the some, some nice fisher in this forest. Uh, on to Kansas, got to set some camera traps with Bob Tim, a, a famous mammologist from Kansas. Now, when we got to Kansas, you know, it's mostly grassland, but they have some of these forests that they've been protecting from fire. And they warned us that there's a lot of poison ivy and there's a lot of ticks. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we're field biologists. We've seen poison ivy and ticks before. But holy cow, here you can see Bob Tim not amused at the condition of this forest and the number of ticks. And here, if you look at the back of this deer, uh, you can see all the ticks on its ear. I've got a lot more. It's pretty, it's pretty dire, actually. Um, so this was uh, my least favorite forest. And I, I do hope they find uh, a fire finds its way to this forest at some point. Um, and then out to the, the west, uh, um, the mountain research station, where we ran out of uh, trees and had to strap to some rocks. Uh, some nice views there, uh, and Yellowstone, where you know sometimes your random point on a map gets you uh, climbing up a rock face. Uh, but the pictures are worth it. The data is really cool. We get some large terrestrial birds as well, of course, turkeys and grouse. Um, and then finally, out out to the west, um, where actually the the soap soap uh, site burned a couple weeks before we were supposed to go there, which is I guess a better than a couple weeks after we went there because then it would have burned up all our cameras. So we had to had to shift and get a little bit nearby. Uh, uh, to a forest nearby that wasn't wasn't officially part of the of the Neon Protocol, but still representative. Um, and you can see as we as a drone kind of zooms out, some of the a lot of the the freestanding dead trees that are 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 just a matter of super dry, just a matter of time before uh, uh, they burn up at some point. So uh, really interesting to see some of these landscapes, and to really fortunate to get a chance to to go out um, and visit so many of these neon sites. Um, of course, out, out the West, you also have the, the joy of knowing that you could have a mountain lion following behind you at any, at any moment. So for each of these sites, we've uh, create, we created a, a summary, uh, a page, uh, shared the pictures with the, with the sites and, and the kind of overall, you know, which species we did, did we detect where. Um, and I'm going to present some results here now where we're using uh, the detection rate from a camera trap as a measure of relative abundance. And as Ariel just explained, um, indices of abundance are not always uh, a best. And in this case, we're using an index because we don't have actual density because we don't have these animals marked. Um, um, but in this case, I think we're, we're doing better than with the beta traps because it's, the, it's not baited. And so it's just animals walking in front of the camera and we get the picture. We're not luring them in. And so uh, the rate at which that happens is, is reflective of their, of their relative abundance. Um, so that's the measure that, and I'm happy to talk more about, about this in, in, if there's some questions about that. Um, so this is what we found overall across all these sites. Um, the size of the pie chart represents the relative abundance of all of these terrestrial mammals. Uh, the color shows some of the different sort of uh, general um, ecological types. And so you can see there in, in Maryland and Virginia had overall the highest abundance of sites. I was a little bit surprised that the, the Cirque site in Maryland is um, uh, you know, kind of ag mixed agricultural and, and forest. We ran all our cameras in the forest, but you know, fragmented, not quite suburban, but almost suburban, but but wow, there were a lot of animals there. Uh, you know, raccoons and deer and squirrels and red foxes, the typical things, but but really high. And then if you just look at the most northern sites in Bartlett, uh, Bartlett New Hampshire, uh, up in northern Michigan, up in uh, Washington State, uh, those have the small circles. Those had the least, the fewest mammals overall by, by quite a dramatic uh, amount. Um, and now, if we just do a PCA on um, to, on these mammal communities, uh, we can uh, um, the the principal component one there on the on the x axis is sort of overall abundance. Basically, you're seeing the uh, the sites on the right had overall more animals, and the sites on the left had fewer. And the next um, uh, index, uh, the, the next sort of axis of the next most important amount of variation are the sites at the top that had more rodents and rabbits and the sites at the bottom that had more terrestrial birds. So uh, Florida had quite a, quite a lot of, of uh, turkeys uh, and uh, Mountain Research Station and uh, um, so Cal California had quite a lot of rodents and rabbits. 
Um, of course, we can break down any of these um, into more detail and look at uh, the species composition across these different sites. Um, I'll show you just a couple, uh, a couple sort of fun comparisons. Here's who had the most coyotes, right? We, we can sort of look at that with this site, uh, Talladega, Alabama had just a ton of coyotes, um, uh, followed by Florida and Wyoming. So I thought this was interesting because, you know, coyotes are not native to the eastern United States that recently colonized there, um, but yet they're still very abundant there. Uh, black bears, uh, Virginia and California had the most black bears. Uh, raccoons, uh, again, Virginia, Maryland, uh, Kansas, lots of raccoons. Gray squirrels, there's our Maryland site again, Virginia, uh, Massachusetts, lots of gray squirrels. Um, so the problem is, uh, here, you know, there's still a lot of gaps on these neon sites. Uh, and so um, during the same time, we worked with Bill McShay and Mike Cove uh, to do a project called Snapshot USA, where uh, we looked for mammologists to run camera traps in a standard way all across the country, running their own camera traps. And so here you can see the first year in 2019, we ended up we were able to recruit people across all 50 states to run cameras. Um, and so they would run sort of 10 to 20 cameras in a, in a standardized protocol uh, near where they live. Um, and you can see here the, all the sites we were able to get. So really starting to fill in uh, some of the gaps. And this is very sustainable. We've been able, we, you know, in 2020, in the COVID year, we, we were able to keep it going. Um, this year, we, we actually have a new grant from, actually have a grant <laughs> from National Science Foundation to support this. The first couple of years, we were just just shoestringing it and doing the best we could. And, and so now we're, we're starting to, to ramp up and hopefully get even more this year. We have uh, over 130 arrays across the country. Um, so we can start to look at, you know, trends over time from these sites. Many of these sites are um, uh, surveying, you know, the same exact same sites over, over years. This is just two years. You can see some places Bobcats going up, some places are going down. Um, we've also now got colleagues in Europe doing a similar project. We're in the second year of, of Snapshot Europe. So we see this as a potential for a large scale, uh, sustainable sort of a big science way to survey mammals. Um, and, and, you know, it's similar to citizen science. We've done some citizen science before, but scientists are a lot easier to work with, right? You scientists, you have your own equipment. You don't need as much training. You get better data. You, we get higher sample size uh, per participant. Um, uh, and so it's really been, uh, I, I think, a good uh, uh, experience. And the payoff is we publish the data together. And so we're all co-authors on the paper. It gives good projects for students to be involved with. Uh, they get early access to the data. We make the data public, but but uh, volunt uh, the, the collaborators get early access. And we have this network of people that are working together, analyzing the data for their own papers. And, you know, sometimes we just need an excuse to go out and set cameras in the field. And so this offers a good excuse every fall to go check out your favorite place, set some cameras, see how the animals are doing. Um, so I want to mention, you know, one of the challenge of doing these big picture, uh, big camera trap projects is you end up with all these pictures and how are you going to deal with that? And I'll just briefly mention, we, we use the Wildlife Insights platform that we helped develop, uh, which has artificial intelligence to help identify the species as you're uploading the pictures and it has some automated analytics that are, are just about to be released, hopefully soon in the next month or two that help you get some insights from your data as well. So this has been really great, uh, really helped us. Here you can see all the data and Wildlife Insights, but it really made the uh, Snapshot USA project possible. Um, and uh, it also off, you know, offers the opportunity to start to share globally uh, data for conservation, although it's not required. So by combining the NEON data and the snapshot data, we now have data from all these different points. Um, and uh, we, we used the uh, GGM model that Ariel mentioned, and we used um, the 25 most common mammal species for this community analysis. We wanted to see how are these different covariates, right? Some habitat and some human and some climate factors. Um, but then also we had the mass data and we broke the mast into four different kinds. The big nuts, which are walnuts and hickory that, you know, most mammals can't get into those. So we separated those out. Then we've got the pines, the other hard mass like acorns and the soft mass, which are fruiting trees. Now, not raspberries or blueberries or bushes, but just fruiting trees. And so here's the sensitivity analysis across all species for these models. The top factors were, the, uh, four of the top five factors were climate and then also terrain which is kind of also an, an abiotic thing. So uh, climate is, is uh, you know, as REL found with the small mammals, with the big mammals, uh, really important. Uh, these forest mass values came in to be pretty important um, uh, as well uh, for, you know, different amounts for different species. Um, and then, um, you know, human population and agriculture, a little bit less important, which was a little bit surprising to me. 
Um, there's kind of some fun things we can do uh, with this, uh, with these results, these model results looking at the, um, uh, for example, it, here, if you're above zero, it's positive impact on a species. And if you're below zero, it's a negative impact. So you can see population size is great for Eastern gray squirrels, right? They do great in developed areas. Um, not, not so much for the fox squirrel, but the fox squirrel does great when there's agriculture around. Um, so you can start to see some of these differences. We can do this with the, the seed production too. If you look at the big nuts, squirrels of both kinds, Eastern gray and fox do great. Um, but if you look at the hard mass, just the acorns, that's really important for the gray squirrel, but uh, the fox squirrel, uh, not so much. Okay, I want to finish uh, wrap up by talking about some of the community stuff we did. Um, we're all familiar with these maps of ecoregions or the communities, uh, uh, you know, the biological communities, which are made from plant data. They're made from, you know, maps of plant data and the relative abundance of those plant, plant data. So we wondered, could we do this with the mammals using this data that we have? Um, and so I'll fly through this a little bit because I'm running a little behind, but basically we have these maps of, of the relative abundance of these species, and then we annotate points across the continent and then uh, identify the communities from that. And so this is our um, it's kind of preliminary uh, uh, map of, of mammal communities across the United, across the United States. Uh, and you can see the first break is the orange and the green, right? If you look at the hierarchy there on the right, which is east and west, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then as you um, go in the eastern United States from north to south, you start to get different communities. Uh, and in the mountains, it's less of a north and south, and it's more of, a, of, a, um, of an elevational factor that breaks that down. So you can see how these play out. And for each of these, we can... Um, also look then what are the animals that are there, right? And, and how common are they? And so on this graph, this is showing the relative abundance of all the different species. Those four sites to the right, those four eco or mammal regions are the Eastern sites. You can see they're all more common. Um, they especially have a lot of white-tailed deer, a lot of raccoons, a lot of Eastern gray squirrels. Um, and then for each of these regions, you can see which species uh, uh, sort of characterize it in terms of them being present at all, or be in terms of their relative abundance? Um, and we can we can we can dive a little deeper into this hierarchy as well, and make sixteen communities, and start to see how that changes as well. So this is brand new stuff. We're still figuring out what it all means, and and still sort of start, starting to compare it. But I think it's exciting. It shows the kinds of things you can do when you do have uh, broad scale data across large areas. Um, so to kind of wrap up, uh, um, you know, we had the fortune of working with uh, NEON data for small mammals, for the seed traps, and for uh, uh, using the sites for our camera trapping. Um, you know, really excited to see what the long-term trends are that come out of this, which, you know, will take a few more years before we can kind of get there. But just right now, doing these comparisons over space and time uh, has allowed us to uh, look at what are some of the drivers of population change. Um, finding that, you know, in particular for the small mammals, climate is really the most important thing, uh, and competition only seems to play in for a few species. And for larger mammals, climate is also very important, uh, and mast uh, being important for some of these. Uh, and it's interesting, right, because the mast isn't just about forest composition, but it's also about the climate, the conditions, right, the rainfall that those trees have as well. Um, and so, um, you know, we're the motivation for this is is that you know starting to understand these relationships and having these kinds of models to make some of these predictions will help us figure out you know how we how can we manage and conserve these mammals as the planet warms up, as the forests change, as the places dry up or get wetter or get hotter. Um, how will that affect our mammal communities? So um, uh, that's it. I'll stop here, and uh, I think Ariel and I both are happy to take any questions. Uh, great. Thank you so much. If everybody can give a round of applause for our uh, maybe virtual <laughs> speakers. That was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Really, really fun to, to hear. Um, so yeah, we'll open it up to questions. I am trying to find the Q&A here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So it looks like there are a few and then I've got one of my own, um, but I'll go ahead and, and read off one from um, Lila Hernandez. Um, she says, Dr. Parkins, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Parsons, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. I'm wondering if the seasonal signal is what is providing a strong correlation to the abundance while environmental and interactions among species factors might not have a clear behavior of, over time. Um, so Ariel, I'll, I'll, I'll open that up for you if you want to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, I Yes, I think that 
you know, the, these correlations with with precipitation and temperature, especially that um, in a lot of cases that these are those those seasonal kind of fluctuations that we know that small mammals are really sensitive to. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we've got those correlations with abundance for some species, those really seemingly strong correlations um, is not super surprising. Um, I, I still think, you know, it, it can it can kind of shed light on the dynamics and the relationships between changes in abundance over time for those species and temperature um, and precipitation that, that we could kind of carry through in terms of making predictions about climate change. But what's going to be really interesting is, is thinking is, um, you know, more data, as, as Roland mentioned, and those long-term trends and those longer-term data um, and seeing, you know, how some of those seasonal cycles in these abiotic factors actually change and, and then what the responses are from the, from the small mammal communities, small mammal populations. Roland, I don't know if you had anything. Yeah, no, I just would, uh, you know, a little bit more detail on the analysis is that, that each, each plot month is an estimate of abundance. And so that's our data point. For, and then, so we have the climate from that. I, I remember, do we use the, the exact three days around that or the month? I can't remember exactly what we, was it th the three days? Yeah, we were exact, yeah. Yeah, so, so it was the temperature at that point. And so so as obviously, is it, it, and then most of the, all the neon sites are just sampling sort of this few months uh, during the warm years. And so we, we don't have any data from the winter. So we have the, this nice data series from the summer and then no data for the winter. And we. We looked at a couple different ways to try to add some winter factors in there, and none of them worked out. So we um, we, we we don't have that, but we do have um, the uh, yeah the the weather at the time when it was sampled, and so um, that's going to vary seasonally, but uh, also a lot between uh, between sites, which I think is going to be even more important. Oh, wonderful! Thanks. Before we move on to one question, may I just suggest, Roland, you mentioned a lot of interesting projects and collaborations and websites. If you felt like dropping any of those in the chat um, through the Q&A, just if people wanted to learn more about the USA Snapshot or the different um, sure. projects okay. you mentioned, that'd be great. Yeah, great idea. Thanks, Samantha. Um, great. I'm going to throw a question out there um, that I had that came up actually from um, uh, Dr. Parsons. Um, so did you do any analyses of those factors that are influencing the variation in detection probability that you showed kind of at the very beginning of your talk? Um, and specifically, I'm kind of wondering from a neon perspective, like, is detection probability varying with temperature and precipitation in a way that would make some of the patterns you're finding harder to find um, without the capture recapture? Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the idea, right? That that if it is, then we can we can capture that and can and control for it. Um, I so this is yeah. I'm going to try and simplify this explanation as much as possible. So the way what we decided to do is try and maximize the amount of abundance information that we could we could take from the neon data, which means we actually ended up doing a, a, a modeling kind of framework that would allow us to harness the, th the three nights and the one night surveys together. So that maximized the number of abundance estimates that we could get, but it meant that we could not model variation in detection probability over space and time, except the fact that it was allowed to vary between sites and between months at a site but we couldn't model it as a function of covariates, right? So if we went back and we just took out those, those one night surveys and we just focused on the three night surveys, that, that could get us to that, but we, we haven't done that yet. But, but yes, conceivably we could do that and that would give you, you know, just even more precise abundance estimates, I would say. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. If you do do that, please let me know. <laughs> I would love to hear. Um, great. So. Uh, Let's see, I'll I'll open it up to the chat, or you can also raise your hand um, as well if something else comes up. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing one here from Eric. Uh, Eric, would you like to just unmute maybe and, uh, and share your question? <laughs> or maybe, is that a, not a possibility with this format? I can also read it. No, no, that's that. Oh, um, if we could unmute Eric. Sokol and Eric can ask his question over audio. That would be wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, I just was unmuted. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question was for Dr. Kays, 
And um, kind of following up on the detection probability uh, thing, and I was just curious if detection, pro like, well, if they're how you handle detection probability with these passive traps, um, for example, like, I know there's work on, you know, how personalities might differ among populations or, you know, uh, animals with different dispersal abilities might be more likely or less likely to get captured in passive traps. And, you know, this could interact with landscape type, like if you're in a dispersal corridor or not. So um, I know that can get complicated, but I'm wondering if just your replication is so high that in your placement with random that it just washes out or just kind of yeah. would be curious about your. Yeah, that's the, that's the idea is um, we don't go out and try to find the best place to run a camera trap. We go out to the GPS point and then that's it. Um, and so we're trying to get a representative sample of um, of the species that are out there. And so, you know, for sure, sometimes a camera might be in a, a corridor where animals are cruising a lot, but then there's going to be another camera that's that's a, in, in an, a non-corridor. Um, and so we're... Um, so we're 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 hoping that it just washed out. We we did a, an analysis a, a couple of years ago. I can drop the the link in in the chat where um, Ariel was on this paper. We we looked at a bunch of existing camera traps to try to figure out uh, studies to try to figure out how many how many sites do you need to to, to for for that to, to work to kind of have have the variation level off. And it was sort of in the uh, forty or more was was a typical. It's going to vary from place to place, but forty or more. So we're we're hopeful that our fifty is is, is enough for that. Cool, thanks for that. Really interesting. Uh, great, uh, and uh, there's another question here. It says, um, how do you overcome the challenge of comparing relative abundances of mammals between sites when cameras are not set up at the same time at each neon site throughout the US? Yeah, so we 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 try to hit it at the same season. Uh, we looked at growing degree days uh, across the sites. And so we, we hit Florida and Alabama a lot earlier in the year. And uh, and Colorado and and other places later. So the seasonality can matter. Obviously, you know some animals hibernate. So you you run a camera, then you're not going to get them at all. Um, and there's some other there's some other seasonal aspects to it. So we tried to uh, for the neon sites, we tried to um, uh, make that as consistent as we could. Um, obviously, there could be some year to year variation as well. Uh, in our snapshot USA stuff, we find the spatial variation is way, way higher than the year-to-year -year variation at the same site. Um, but uh, uh, um, so that's kind of what we're focusing on in this analysis is what is the spatial variation without, uh, you know, we don't have the time series to do what Ariel did to look at the temporal variation as well uh, at the moment, but hopefully we will eventually. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Samantha, do we have time for one more, you think, or should we start? I, we could do one, one. Let's do one more quick question. Okay, great. Uh, there is, there's one from Courtney as well about just how neon samples tend to dominate, uh, sample in the dominant habitat, uh, types. And so, uh, it's, um, just kind of getting your sense for how more rare habitat types, if they were sampled would affect the results. Um, so I, I, this is coming from a plant perspective, I think, where rare habitats hold a lot of richness at the landscape scale. And so how, how do rare habitats and small mammal abundances um, relate? Yeah, I know that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, and it, it's not something that, that we've looked at a heck of a lot in terms of with our analysis of the small mammals, we, we weren't, we were pulling kind of proxies. We were correlating proxies of habitat, you know, mass um, production, grass uh, availability, understory kind of thickness, a lot of these measurements that NEON takes um, at these sites, but not that, that not anything more specific about the habitat types themselves. Um, but obviously, you know, if you have low representation of some of those variables uh, among all the samples that you're collecting, um, then, you know, it, it's going to wash out any, any contribution that that has. Um, you know, to to kind of the the abundances. Um, so you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's hard because you don't you you want to sample the dominant habitat types, or you want to kind of stratify amongst the habitat types that are available, really, to get the most kind of representative sample. In in my mind, yeah, I think uh, to just add, like you know, we weren't this wasn't really a diversity study. We weren't trying to find all the species that were there. In which case, we would do that. But both Ariel's analyses and mine focus on the most abundant species. You know, there are mice that only have, you know, show up a couple of times and you can't do a density estimate on that and you can't add them to these kinds of analyses. So um, I think that, you know, there's there's lots of interesting stuff you could do with them, but that's kind of 
doesn't fit within the the these large scale comparisons that you're doing, you, you got to have enough data to work with. So we're on both these, we're sort of just focusing on the more abundant, more common, which are ecologically more important, but certainly there's a lot of importance to the diversity and the species that are rare as well. That just wasn't our focus. Well, thank you all so much. We, are, we have reached the end of our hour. I know there were more questions, but this was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Everyone, if you're interested in neon small mammal data on January 31st, we're going to have a, a webinar on how you can access and work with the neon small mammal data hosted by Sarah. So please consider joining as well as we have our next iteration of the monthly seminar series in February. I've got the link in the chat for you. Thanks again, everyone. We really appreciate having you and we'll see you next time. Bye.